it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and it's also quite of a challenge. I come from DTU Compute, so I work with technology. Um, and I will tell you a, a lot about technology and, and how this can be used. Um, and it's clearly now that we just uh, saw on the video, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to, uh, to compete with, uh, with him on, on this issue. A little bit about uh, my background. So uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a professor in computer-based systems. Um, uh, I'm also heading a, a group at DTU Compute. At the moment, I'm also uh, deputy director of uh, DTU Compute. And uh, I have been involved for some time in, um, in innovation, uh, which has also created my interest in, uh, in this field. Uh, among others, I, I co-founded a company called Biomicore, which is a spin-out from some uh, research development we did. Uh, we believe that it would disrupt the world. It, it's still to be seen. Um, we created a, a self-repairing, a self-healing computer architecture, uh, but, <clears throat> uh, but that's another story. I'm also in a number of advisory boards uh, on small startups that also have ideas of di disrupting the world. Um, I'm in also in uh, related to uh, uh, our engineering associations, uh, future technology part. And then I have been co-founder of Singularity U Copenhagen. Um, so I don't know how, how many of you know about Singularity University. I've heard about it. So some of you have. It's, it's not a university in any sense. It's more like an entrepreneurial uh, school where there is uh, a lot of focus on the possibilities of technology and how you can bring that, these ideas into, uh, into some products. Um, in Denmark, there is quite a few. I think we are uh, more than 50 people that have been through one of the programs there. And there are several professors here from DTU that also have been part of this. And we have an alumni uh, where we, we co-founded this uh, event. So we are doing some, uh, uh, some talks, uh, inviting people similar to, to this. Um, <clears throat> we are also running uh, Danske Idea, if you have heard about this. So it's uh, um, young people with, or maybe not so young, all of them, but uh, with good ideas are applying for being part of a five days intensive program that runs from eight in the morning to 10 in the evening, uh, where they learn about a lot of different technologies and where they uh, are going to develop uh, an idea. They learn about entrepreneurship, about doing pitches and so on. And they are extremely diverse. So it's from uh, uh, someone having a PhD in, in uh, physics to, to some uh, young guy just uh, got out of uh, high school and have started three companies uh, and has a lot of energy. So it's a very diverse and very interesting group of, uh, of students. We select 65 out of uh, around 200 that apply for this and they go through this program. It's funded by Industrien's Fund and uh, out of this we select one that goes to, uh, uh, to a 10 weeks program at uh, NASA Ames where Singularity University is, uh, is hosted. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say too much about this, but, uh, but then get started with, uh, with, with this. So the title of the talk was sort of given to me. Uh, so I have to try to give you an idea about this uh, disruption. And of course, using uh, Clayton Christensen's uh, way of defining it, this is of course a, a good way of doing it. And I'm using this uh, chart. So over time, and you have the product performance uh, up. Um, then you have different uh, uh, streams of, of uh, the market from the low end to the high end. That was also what he talked about in, his, uh, in, his, uh, in this interview. And uh, normally uh, what we call sustaining innovation is something that gradually improves to, to higher and higher end uh, markets. And uh, if we look at other kinds of innovation in that setting, 
then the typical one is something that, that loops like this. So what does it mean? It means that uh, at some point somebody comes in with a better idea and is actually able to produce uh, a better product performance for some time. Uh, and that gain you a window where you can uh, enter into the market. But usually at some time, at some point, these, let's say, more well-established companies will, will catch up and uh, buy you out or compete you out of, the, out of the market. So innovation goes typically in these kind of uh, hubs. And then we have this uh, disruptive innovation, which is uh, slightly different. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure you all know about this, so I'll uh, do it. Uh, rather quickly, but, but the idea here is that uh, you enter into the market in some very low end where, uh, where you're not a threat for, for the big players. And I think uh, Airbnb is, is a good example of this because they started out being uh, sort of a community for backpackers to find housing when they're traveling. They had no money and, and so on. So they were not really a, a threat for hotel, big hotels that were living out of uh, customers paying high prices to stay in nice places. But as we know, they have actually entered into this and is, uh, is now uh, the largest, uh, let's say, hotel uh, in, in the world. Um, there was also this about, uh, uh, what about Uber? I think in my term then Uber would not be a disruptive technology because they're actually in the same market as the, as the normal taxis. They're just using another uh, business model of, the, of that. So that would, I mean, it's clearly innovative, but maybe not disruptive. Okay, I'm, I'm not a business person. Uh, and uh, as I said, I have this company that haven't earned much money yet. Uh, and it has been in existence for some years. So I'm not going to try to, uh, to give you an idea about how uh, to earn money, but I can tell you about technology and what we are going to see uh, happening in, in the near future. And that's what I want to do. But instead of trying to talk about existing companies and existing challenges, I want to go a little bit back in history. So Clayton also said in his that uh, normally we think about disruptive innovation requiring really substantial amount of funding to, to do something spectacular. And this is typically one of the things that we are thinking about, the space shuttle that requires a, a nation. It's so expensive that you want to have a fuel nation to pay uh, for building and achieving the, uh, the goals that you want to, to set out for. Now we are talking much about disruptive innovation and so on as if this is something new. I don't think it's something new. And this is what I want to go back and try to look at because it's always funny to look at the challenges we have today by looking back and see how it has been in history. Uh, so that would be the first part of my talk. And the second part, I will go into various technologies, of course, starting out with, with computers, uh, but, uh, but we will see. So this is, uh, is the ship of, uh, of uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, when you tell this to, uh, to young people, they ask if it's the real ship. Um, <clears throat> not knowing that uh, this is way before the camera was uh, <laughs> invented. Uh, so what, what was the purpose of, uh, of him going out? Well, that was actually at the, at the point where uh, he was trying to find a cheaper way to get spices. So spices were sort of like the topic uh, of this. And why? Well, that was more valuable than gold. So this was a, something where you could earn a lot of money. The challenge was that uh, although you, you were able to get it uh, today, it was very difficult to really get enough of it for, for the market uh, required. And uh, you had long and uh, slow and also dangerous routes to, to get the spices. So his idea was uh, uh, getting to, uh, to India by sailing the other way around, as you, as you probably know, and trying to uh, hopefully be uh, able to get a better way of getting these spices. Now, one of the, the reasons why spices was, uh, was so popular at that time was that it was believed to um, uh, to, to help in uh, preserving food 
Um, so, uh, so that was one part of, uh, of it. Now clearly, later on, know that it doesn't preserve food. It, you can just not taste the badness of, of, the, of the food, but that was a different thing. So what happened was he, he managed to raise enough money, convince uh, the government to, to help out in, in financing this tour. And uh, as, we, as we know, uh, he partly succeeded. He didn't get to India. Um, and uh, probably that was lucky because at that time, I mean, we were believed that the world was much smaller than it actually was. So uh, the yellow part here is, is the map from that time. Um, and uh, beneath, you can see the real map. So, I mean, in the real map, India would be somewhere out here, and they would never have survived going all that way. But they got to, uh, to the coast where they believed, uh, what they believed was, uh, was India. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so they managed to, to do this, and uh, that became a new route for, for getting spices and a very healthy uh, economy for that. So uh, now you, we could ask the question about this huge industry. Who, who disrupted this? Is anyone knowing that? Having an idea of it? Yeah. 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 So this guy, Frederick Tudor. I'm pretty sure you don't know who this guy is. Um, so <clears throat> he actually was the, the one inventing the ice house, constructing uh, houses where you could pack with, with ice and then you could cool down the food of it. And it was in the, uh, the Massachusetts area where you in the winter had uh, a lot of ice on the lakes. And he created an industry about cutting up these ice and bringing it into these houses. And he also managed to uh, to make ships where you could have it uh, cold, so you could act, instead of using the spices, you could actually have uh, cool rooms on the ship, so you could preserve the food for uh, for what you needed. Um, this was in itself a challenge, and I think uh, uh, the two first times he tried to to, uh, to get across the Atlantic with this uh, didn't succeed. Uh, the third time. Uh, he managed, but only one third of the ice was, was left there. But what he gained by selling this paid for all the three trips. Um, and that, of course, then disrupted the, the whole uh, spice industry. Now, we also know we got to have uh, like these ice boxes that you could have in, in your home, and that would work uh, around like this. And of course, then the next question, who then disrupted this big industry? And, and as you said, well, there was another guy who invented uh, a machine that could actually cool. And that turned into uh, what we know of the refrigerator of, of today. So we, can, we don't have to go and store things in, in uh, separate buildings, but we can have it in our own fridge. So it's, it's, uh, what the point here is that it's, uh, even though you're in there, it's very difficult to see what is going to disrupt you. Afterwards, it may be easy to see that, yes, of course, it would have been like this. And, uh, and there is a reason uh, uh, for, for this. Uh, and um, one of these things is that um, for many technologies, uh, like the computer technology that I will uh, continue with, is that uh, if they are growing on an exponential or something that looks like an exponential curve, then in the beginning we would have uh, a tendency to, to project linearly. So that means, and that's also what we are seeing with many of the technologies where they come, come up, like uh, artificial intelligence, there is a promise that they will solve everything and years and years goes on and, and nothing really happens and people start getting disappointed. That is, uh, is this point over here. So we are disappointed about it. You probably know the Gartner cur hype curve. That's another way of, of phrasing this, that in the beginning you have a lot of hype about it and everybody expects that within the next couple of years everything will change and nothing happens. But it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. At some point this curve starts uh, when it starts moving up, 
then at one point you realize that, oh, it will happen. But then it's going so fast that it may be difficult. So, so um, how do you manage uh, doing this? Now, when you get to that point, then there is, uh, of course, a lot of cares, but there's also a lot of uh, opportunities. And how do we make sure that we foresee some of this so we can actually uh, be prepared for these opportunities? So please ask uh, questions uh, while I'm, I'm talking. So now I, I want to, uh, uh, to focus on, let's say, my major domain, which is computing. And uh, see, there we all know how it, it, it went and what is happening today. Uh, but I want to go again a little back uh, in, uh, in time, um, back to the time where uh, the World War II, where the Germans had this enigma, the coding uh, machine, which they used to code the messages uh, about where they wanted to attack and so on. Now, um, in order to, uh, to, to counterfeit this one, uh, the British had uh, what they called the human computer. So a number of humans that was told to follow some very strict rules on trying to break the codes. And of course, there was a game of, uh, of, uh, of speed in this uh, because the Enigma code changed uh, over time. And uh, if it should be of any help, the British had to, uh, uh, to decode it before so that they could actually uh, interfere with the, with the things. Now, this is uh, <clears throat> part of where Alan Turing, which is uh, one of the uh, great scientist in, in computer science where um, and he proposed this that the human computer is supposed to be following fixed rules. He has no authority to deviate from them in any detail. So you had a very precise description of what to do and you followed that and then maybe you would break the code or the neighboring would break the code. And the more people could work on this in parallel, the faster you could actually decode. Um, but if you have seen the imitation game, you also know that this was a challenge. And he was working hard in trying to uh, speed up this, uh, this decoding by building a machine that could do this. And this was uh, what was uh, known as the bump machine. So it's a combination of electrical and mechanical uh, computing that was able to try to, to, uh, to decode uh, the German's uh, ciphered code. Uh, the whole purpose of this was to be faster, to beat things on, on being faster. And this has, of course, continued. And uh, we know today, we also saw it in, in, the, in the video with the interview of uh, Clayton Christensen, that uh, we now have mobile phones. We, uh, we connect them to the cloud where we can store a lot of data. We can do a lot of really advanced computing. But there's also the other side of it which is what we would call the sensor swarm. A lot of small devices that are able to do things, send something in the environment, uh, on our body, around in the buildings and so on, and collect this information that then can be displayed to us on the mobile or put into the cloud to do some computation from which we can get some uh, feedback. Um, and this is what I uh, would like to uh, uh, to explore a little bit uh, more. So if we look into, into the computer, the basic of this, the brain of this is the computer chip. And uh, <clears throat> you may know uh, what the basics of a computer chip is, but I'll try to give you an idea of this. So if we look inside the computer, what the basic device in there is a transistor. And the transistor is simply a switch that can turn on and off. And it does it by, if I apply current on the, on the red here, I'm allowed to, uh, to pass beneath here with current. If I don't have any, I cannot pass. So that's a very simple way to put it. So by applying current, I can turn on and off uh, a switch for uh, doing current. So what can I do with such a component? Well, I can put several of these together, as you can see it here. And they may build up some, some larger function. I'll come back to what kind of functions we can build up uh, from this. Then, of course, I can put those together, building some 
bigger systems and putting yet more together and yet more together into, into devices. And uh, from this one, I, I can go further, and then I have the whole chip. And this whole chip may not be much more than a grain of rice. Now, this is the Intel Atom processor. It has in the order of 50 million of these transistors inside of it. That's an enormous amount of computation on a very, very small uh, piece of device. So we can do really, really sophisticated things, not only in the cloud, but also very close to, uh, to the sensors. And today, one of the biggest uh, chips has 20 billion transistors. It's a large number. And if you put it into context, it's one tenth of the amount of stars that we have in our galaxy, or what we believe to be in our gal galaxy. This is the amount of transistors that these engineers that build these computers have to put together, place them in the right order, wiring them correctly so that they make whatever function uh, we want them to, uh, to achieve. And it's clearly that this can only be done by using computers. So we use computers to design computers and that is why one of the reasons we have seen uh, this uh, exponential scaling. Of course also uh, in, the, in the technology development. This is what is known as, as Moore's law. Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, uh, predicted very early on that when he saw the generation of technologies they could develop, that uh, the amount of, of transistors you could put on a certain uh, size of a chip would double every 18 uh, months or so. Uh, it started out in, in 47 with the first uh, silicon-based transistor, and then in uh, 71, we had the first uh, real microprocessor. It had in the order of 2,300 uh, transistors, and that was the first programmable uh, processor. And then from that on, we get to, to these other uh, numbers that I showed you of. So, so this is the basic of it, and it, may, it means that uh, we can do uh, computation in smaller, faster, and cheaper, uh, and also a lot better. And this has sort of fueled this uh, digital revolution that we have seen, where we now are digitizing everything. And uh, that's what I want to, uh, to try uh, to look a little bit into, to give you an idea of what we are probably going to see ahead. Before we do that, let's look a little bit about uh, the algorithm. So that's uh, sort of the functions that we want our computers to do. So an algorithm is just a sequence of instruction that tells the computer exactly what it should do. So in that sense, it mimics pretty much the way that uh, Alan Turing had with, with the humans. You had to follow a very specific re recipe. And this is what computers are extremely good at doing following a very strict uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of instructions. Um, <clears throat> now, if we, if we look into it, the, the simplest possible algorithm we can think of is one that is switching on and off a single transistor. Um, and uh, Claude Shannon, which is another of the famous uh, uh, computer science uh, person, or is actually say, the founder of information technology, he uh, realized that uh, if you have transistors that are switching, and switching on and off as a response to other transistors shifting, this is actually logic reasoning. So this is what happens in the computer. It's logic reasoning. It's not really calculation. But you can, from logic reasoning, you can do calculation. But we are thinking about computers as being good at calculating, but they are really good at, at reasoning. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, based on this, then every algorithm you can think of can be reduced to just these three uh, basic operations, an AND, logic AND, logic OR, and a NOT. And when you're working with electronics, you have a schematic for each of these. It takes a, in the amount of six transistors or so to build each of these. You can do this one with two transistors. So if you have like a billion of them, you can do a lot of logic. 
and, and the, the question is, of course, how do you do this? And that we then come to the programming. So how do we turn the algorithms into something that the computer can actually understand? Now, if we look at it, and I do it in a very schematic, very simple way, then typically I would have uh, like a function, and now we do it just very simple, so my algorithm is just the adding two numbers. So what I need to have is some another algorithm that can actually translate this expression into something the computer can understand, which is zeros and ones, turning on and off things. Um, this, of course, requires that I know what kind of technology, what is the computer chip, what is the... Nowadays, we have uh, managed to, uh, to elaborate a bit on this, so uh, we don't have to... Uh, well, you know that uh, what runs on, on, uh, uh, on, on certain types of uh, machines, like the Mac, is different from what on, on the classical PCs, and you cannot just switch the programs, you have to recompile them. So you have to have some algorithm that can actually translate so that uh, they can work uh, on similar uh, technologies. So we, know, we need to know what kind of technology we are going to program for. And then we may also have some requirements, and typically that could be that it has to complete within some time, or it cannot use more than certain amount of, uh, of energy resources to, to do this computation. And this is basically what is needed. When we have the zeros and one, we can put them into the computer and then it can just execute on that. Now, uh, <clears throat> this means that looking into this very abstract and very powerful way of looking at changing an algorithm uh, uh, into working on a specific technology, we could start thinking about what kind of technologies could we have and what would that mean for an algorithm. Um, so that is actually looking to bring the things that we have learned in, uh, in the computer science uh, into other domains. And uh, that I will, I will give you a flavor of by using this way of reasoning. Um, and uh, then hopefully you would start seeing uh, some of the possibilities that we are likely to see, well, some of them are already here, uh, but uh, there are some that uh, we will see coming. So I'll start out with, with AI and robotics. Uh, so basically I can think of a robot as some mechanical uh, device that can, that can move, it can be controlled, and uh, typically I will do this by having some sensors on it that knows on like angles and uh, forces. Um, and I would need to have a, a computer to control this. So this is where we have the brain. Uh, so we, we build some sensoring and actuating, so it could be both, I mean, as a sensing things, as I said, but also something that then uh, guide the motor to, uh, to move the arm. And all of this can be controlled by an algorithm running on my, on my computer. Now, if I look like this, then uh, I can do exactly the same as before. I can devise an algorithm that can take this... Uh, uh, behavior that I want my robot to do, and given the specific robot that gives me some basic operations, I can turn this high-level behavior into something that, uh, that controls the movement of the arm in, in the right way. So I can control robots uh, like this. And again, there might be re resources on uh, constraints on how much weight can it lift, and it has to do it within some, uh, some amount of time. Um, so uh, <clears throat> if we then start thinking about artificial intelligence, uh, so, so this is actually defined as, as being the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. So what does it mean that a machine gets intelligent? Um, one of the things that is also very, very much in uh, um, a hot topic at the moment is machine learning. And the interesting thing here is that it's actually the study of computer algorithms that can improve their way of acting in an automatic way through experience so they can actually learn by doing. So now it's no longer a very strict, rigid definition of exactly what it should do, but it actually evolves over time. And we have seen some tremendous uh, uh, 
examples of what this can bring to us. And I think at the moment, I mean, we get really, really interesting uh, new results out. Uh, not every day, but almost. It, one example of this is uh, the robot driver. So this is uh, Google's car. I think you probably know about this. It's, uh, um, it's really highly sophisticated and uh, uh, it was driven out of uh, or started by DARPA having a, a competition where they wanted to do autonomous driving and people were saying that it, this, is, this is so complex that humans can do it but you cannot get machines to do this. And in uh, 2004 they had the first competition, it was in the Mojave Desert, it was uh, a stretch of 240 kilometers and uh, none of the cars completed. Uh, several of them didn't get much further than just starting, even getting out of the, uh, the starting area was, was, a, was a challenge. And the one who got the first got some 11.7 kilometers before it crashed. So that was sort of like clearly indication that this is not possible. The next year they had an, another, yet another competition again uh, with the same ideas, but this time uh, five out of 23, I, I believe it was, actually completed the full route. So that in one year, that was a tremendous uh, uh, achievement. And then there has been consecutive competitions like this, urban driving, so driving among cars and so on. You can find YouTube videos of this. The first competitions there were really interesting. Uh, you had several deadlocks and, and cars driving off the street into houses or uh, different things. Uh, but as you know, uh, today it's, it, I mean, in more and more of states uh, in the US, you are allowed to have autonomous driving cars and even in, in countries in Europe and so on, you start seeing this. And most of the car industry are working on coming up with, uh, with solutions for this within a few years. Um, Google's car has been, or car, a set of cars, they don't tell how many, but a set of cars has been driving uh, for, uh, for more than around 2.4 uh, million kilometers without any serious uh, accidents. So we will see uh, autonomous cars uh, uh, being in our daily uh, life pretty soon. I'm pretty sure it would be difficult to get insurance to if you insist driving yourself. But that's of course to be seen. Now another competition uh, that has been running also by, uh, by DARPA has been on, on, uh, on uh, robotics, moving robots, not by car. And one of the latest one is on, uh, uh, on humanoid uh, robots. And uh, one of the challenges there is not just to get it to walk on two legs, but to, uh, to have it help out in, uh, in disaster areas. So can they go in and find things, uh, places where it's really uh, complicated. And I'll just show you a little bit of a, of a video for, from uh, Boston Dynamics, which is, uh, it doesn't matter with, with the sound. Um, so some of the things that is extremely simple for us is extremely complicated for, for robots. Things like going through doors, uh, understanding how to operate them, and going into keeping balance, going in, in terrain is, is also very, very complicated. I think Boston Dynamics is probably one of the, uh, let's say, most advanced uh, robot companies uh, in, in the world. And here you see. Yeah, it, it looks. Uh, it looks similar, right? Familiar for... <laughs> but this, this requires a, a... It requires a lot of sensors and actuators to, to really mimic this. Um, there's a lot of other things uh, which is quite interesting to, uh, to see. Um, <clears throat> So uh, 
So you can think of robots doing more and more of, of, uh, of our uh, daily work. And you probably also have, have read there was a few years ago, there was uh, a series of uh, articles uh, about what kind of jobs that uh, computers would take over. Um, and uh, clearly the journalist writing this has said there were some jobs that couldn't be taken over by, by computers and one of those were journalism. But if you look at today, there are computers that are writing uh, articles where you, you don't, you're not able to see that it's not a human that has done it. And they're especially good at uh, um, sp spelling is one thing, but working on, on uh, uh, let's say, stock market articles and sport articles, uh, getting the essence out of it and selling it in, in the right way. And then, of course, it's very, uh, clear that for us to say, but there is one thing they cannot do, they cannot do science. But this is an example of a robot that is actually doing science. It's from, uh, from the UK. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a robot control biolab uh, where, again, using uh, machine uh, learning techniques, the, uh, the, um, the robot figure out experiments that it wants to do, and then it does it and then maybe it find out something new. So we are start seeing the robot scientist, and I think this can be taken, uh, this is already a few years old, so I think this is going to be uh, taken much, much further. So I, I think uh, it's much, it's, it's very likely that we, most of us would have some assistant like this to help us uh, to do our scientific experiments. Um, but this of course brings in the, uh, this about the laboratories. So uh, uh, what we are seeing here, uh, um, and, and we could think of it from, from a healthcare perspective. Now, if I feel ill and uh, I want to, uh, to have sort of a second opinion, figuring out whether I'm really ill, I go to my doctor. Most likely, he or she will take a blood sample, send it to a lab, and after some time, typically a week or, or more, I will get some result back or the doctor will get some result back and then I can go visit him again and uh, get a, uh, information about, about this. Uh, somehow this is sort of like not really uh, uh, very efficient. So you could think of the idea, why not take all of this and put it into, into our smartphone? We are carrying this around all the time. So now I would be able to, uh, to just run these tests directly from my, from my smartphone. So this would be a perfect point of care device. So I could have it with me. I could do some blood samples and I could do some analysis on it. Um, <clears throat> this may sound uh, a little bit for, uh, far-fetched, but, uh, but this is actually some of the things that we are working on uh, at the moment. So I'm in a project together with uh, uh, DTU Nanotech where we are building uh, an interface into a smartphone from, a, from one of these micro labs. So basically, when you put all of this together, you may get what we would call a doctor in your pocket. So you can do everything on the spot. You may actually be able to screen and also doing some diagnostics uh, directly from the sample and the uh, actuation of the samples that you are doing. Now, <clears throat> this is not a new idea. So this is the uh, tricorder from Star Trek back in the 60s. This was a device, if you've seen it in the movie, they have this and you just point it to a person and then you get everything about health condition about the person. Um, so uh, uh, this is of course a very interesting, this is a far-fetched science fiction uh, idea at that point in time, but today it's, uh, it's almost possible to do uh, by one thing, by this X Prize. I don't know if you know about the X Prize. So that is uh, some grand challenges where you can win a million or $10, $10 million for solving some problem. <clears throat> and there is at the moment a competition going on to actually build something like this. The idea is that you have to uh, make a dev handheld device uh, that can uh, detect 
I think it's 15 different conditions on a number of patients uh, within an hour and do it better than uh, expert doctors. And it should be, uh, the one using this device should be just an ordinary person, no medical uh, education or anything. <clears throat> and there is, uh, it has been running for a couple of years and now there are uh, in the finals. So there, <clears throat> I think some, sometime this year, uh, they will find the winner. And these prizes, uh, which has become very popular, it's of course something that started out of the US. Uh, if you know about, the first one was uh, on trying to, uh, uh, to make uh, space, the space industry uh, industrialized. So it's no longer just the governments that can do this, but actually private industries can, can do this. <clears throat> and the first X prize on, on $10 million was those who could build a spaceship that they could put into orbit and back again with four persons and repeat it within two weeks. Um, and uh, the world's one succeeded in this and uh, we have seen that now several companies are starting to actually get into, uh, into the space uh, programs and also doing some very nice things about landing rockets again uh, on a platform on sea and so on. So a lot of uh, innovation uh, happening in these, uh, in these areas. Um, now, <clears throat> you could go on further that uh, if you have uh, these devices, uh, well, then uh, maybe I should say that inside, of course, I will have my, my chip, the computing power that can do the analysis and maybe the control of the lab, but I would need to have a lab inside the, this, uh, this device. Again, this may uh, sound like, uh, like science fiction, but this is actually uh, possible. And if you look into what the basic device in such a lab is, is, it's a valve. So it's something where you can open and close. And in one of the technologies, you can, uh, you can think of it like, like this. The blue is where I have the liquid flowing, and the red one is, uh, is where I have air pressure. So if I put pressure into the, to the red layer, it would expand and then it would pinch off the, the, the layer beneath. So it's like uh, when you have your uh, water tube in the garden and you step on it and nothing comes through and you release and then it goes through. So you can build things like this in a very small scale. So this is one example, it's from 2002. It has 2,500 valves. So that's a complexity, the same order of the uh, first uh, microcomputer. Uh, and it looks pretty much like it. So you have, uh, now it's not wires with, with electrons, but now it's small channels with liquids inside or air. And this is one of the things that uh, we are working on because we have, have a lot of tools and methods for the electronic chips. And we have been thinking of, well, sh why can we not use those tools, those methods for de developing uh, these kind of devices and we have been uh, quite successful in that. Just to give you an idea, it's possible today to build like one million valves on a square centimeter. Uh, so it's really advanced labs that you can build on a very, very small scale. So it's not uh, completely uh, out of the question to actually carry a full lab uh, around with you. One of the challenges is uh, that uh, for every new uh, let's say, essay uh, protocol you want to run on this, you have to design the chip for it. It would be like every time you have a new program, you have to build a new computer to run it. So we are looking into what is the equivalent of, uh, of the more general purpose computer in, uh, in, the, in this area. Uh, just to give you an idea how it works, so here it's one uh, part, some liquid coming in in a, in a chamber, you can close off then you put in another one uh, and then in this sealed chamber when you turn off the, uh, the valves here and you open and close some of the valves pretty fast, you change the pressure inside and you can get the liquid to rotate and then it gets mixed. It's not in these scales, it's not so easy to mix uh, things. Um, but this is one way you can do it. Another way you can work with it is, is digital microfluidics. So you have uh, small drops you suck in, and then you have electrodes here by 
turning on and off the uh, electrodes, you can get them to move. You can have two drops moving. You shake them a bit, it mix, and you split it again. So that's another way of, uh, of doing such uh, operations uh, on a very small scale. So we are talking about something that is way below microliters. It's uh, nanoliters or maybe even picoliters. Uh, but I'll come back to that. So this technology has seen sort of the same as we have seen in microelectronics, going smaller, faster, and cheaper from the room-sized, where you have lab uh, assistants with pipettes doing the things, into the robot, uh, which is sort of table-sized. But <coughs> mainly here, it's doing exactly the same as the humans are doing, but in smaller spaces and faster, but it's still moving pipettes and moving small liquids around inside uh, to something that is coin-sized, uh, where you do a lot of activities in it. So changing things. There's a lot of other uh, advantages of going so small. You, you, you use less reagents, it the, the reactions becomes faster and so on. There's also some challenges. Um, <clears throat> so it's possible to, to have this scenario of, uh, of a doctor in, in, your, in your pocket and maybe even going below that. So getting into let's say pills that you get inside that I do analysis of, uh, of things uh, while going in there. We are uh, working on ideas of building a, uh, a pill, again together with nanotech and a, and a bunch of other uh, industries to do a, a pill size uh, device that can diagnose for colon cancer. Um, again, Going back, uh, the programming of these is, is like, similar to the others. I have an algorithm. I, here it's A plus B is not adding numbers. Here it's adding liquids, mixing liquids. Uh, and I have a device, so the technology describe how the device works. And then I can make an algorithm that actually produce the right sequence of things that makes this happen on this device. This is what we are working. Uh, working on and of course it's it's nice if this one can run in your smartphone as well so it the the smartphone can instrument the the lab and tell what to do and measure do the the reactions and then having sensors that measures what's uh, what is the result of these and being able to do analysis of it uh, uh, on the way this, this is what we are going to see much more of so the last part Because when you get into working with liquids that are at the size of the liquid which is inside a cell, you can work in these labs with uh, uh, these biochips with, uh, with having small bubbles where you cap encapsulate a single cell in each and then you can start not working on, on billions of cells in a, in a flask but actually individual cells and see how they react. And that gets us into to this uh, next uh, part, which is uh, I call biobots. So it's not robots, but it's actually biological robots on a very, very small scale. But let's let's look into this. If you if you look at the at the, this is an example of a bacteria. When you look into it, you will typically see that at a very abstract level, what happens is that it has a sensing part, a computing part, and an acting part. So it may sense molecules from the surrounding, maybe some products that is created inside itself, and then uh, doing some computation. I do this with this logic uh, that, I, uh, that I use to explain uh, an algorithm. And then it can produce some, some proteins that it can actually send out. And this, of course, has been, been used to, uh, to re-engineer organisms, so like uh, yeast cells to produce uh, certain, uh, uh, like uh, insulin, for instance. You can, you can start having, uh, doing these biofabs uh, that uh, are extremely good at uh, producing certain uh, molecules. Now, for me, this looks like a computer. And I'm interested in trying to see if I can, if I can decide what, what this should be. Can I change this one in the cell? Can I change it so that the behavior of this bacteria is changed? Now, just to give you an idea of, of genetic engineering, 
this is an example, so a, a, a fluorescence uh, jellyfish. You, you look at the gene, you, you uh, find out the part that actually makes it glow. You isolate that part, and then you could take a, a plant, a tree, you get that DNA sequence, and then you put the glowing part into it, and then hopefully you would get a, a tree that glows. Um, and this sounds like uh, something crazy. I don't know how many of you have probably heard about uh, this, uh, this idea. So this was actually a, uh, an example. Some students in the US had this idea and, and uh, raised uh, uh, half a million uh, dollar on Kickstarter to build a company where you were selling glowing plants. So on Valentine's you could uh, buy <laughs> roses that were glowing in different colors and so on. Um, I tried to, uh, this is a little bit old, I tried to catch up on this. I think they had some, uh, some difficulties. Uh, I don't know if that was on, on legal things or ethical things and so on. That, uh, so I think they, they changed, but uh, until recently uh, they had this promise. Um, and the idea is of course that we have been extremely good to uh, understand DNA by reading it. So again, building machines that can do this. Um, you probably heard uh, about, I mean, the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome has in the order of three billion uh, uh, base pairs that uh, that needs to be understood. And uh, what they wanted was to to actually have a sequencing machine that can actually convert this one into the alphabet of the four letters. So. Slightly different than from computers, which only have ones and zero, you have four different characters here. Um, but um, pretty much the same way. The, the DNA is sort of like the software of these living things. It's actually the blueprint of which, how they behave. Now, when they started out, uh, it was planned to be a 15 years project where they wanted to sequence all of this. It was almost $3 billion project. And at that time, people said, this, this is not possible. Uh, it's a waste of money. We will never, I mean, what sh why should we spend $3 billion on, on sequence, just one human genome? I mean, we could learn something, but then we would learn something about this specific individual. Um, halfway through the project, they have sequenced 1% of it. And then people made the linear prediction and said, it will take a couple of hundred years before we complete. Um, so let's stop the project. It was continued, and in 2001, they, two years before actually planned, they managed to, to sequence it. But of course, 13 years and, and $3 uh, billion, uh, dollars, that's a lot. But if you look seven years later, you could do it in six weeks for 100000 And last year, something in the order of three days for $1,000. And this is keep going down. So one of the, 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 uh, one of the guys behind uh, uh, or have been involved in, in building some of these machines, he predicts that in, in a few years' time, it would be cheaper to do a DNA sequencing than to flush your toilet. Uh, it's very amazing to see. So it follows, so this is an exponential curve. Uh, or logarithmic scale, so the straight line means exponential. This is the cost per transistor of Moore's law. And you see at some point it goes dramatically below. So it becomes extremely uh, cheap. And that's because they find out building machines that can do this extremely efficient. This was uh, the Lumia that was part of being developed for, for, for these uh, projects and this progress. But actually, today you can get a sequence of which is on the size of a USB stick, using some very advanced uh, nanotechnology to uh, to do this. So we will get there. We will be that will be part of our smartphone at some point as well. So again, you see smaller, faster, uh, and cheaper. Now, reading is is one thing, and by doing this, people have been able to uh, to pinpoint different uh, functionalities of the DNA. So I can get in and understand a part that say something like it, that if red molecules are present, then do green, otherwise don't do anything, right? And then why, what could you use for this? Well, it has been used to, uh, to do uh, uh, drugs for malaria. So in Africa, 2,000 kids are 
dying every day of malaria, and it's a very expensive to do the drug <coughs> because it's, it requires this artemisinin from uh, a very rare plant and where the process of extracting it is also very uh, costly. Um, so some researchers in, in the US at, at Berkeley came up with the idea of trying to re-engineer yeast cells so that they could actually produce this artemisinin. And they succeeded in doing this. They made a company that is, is, is running now, which means that you can produce this drug similar to the way that you are brewing beer. And that is something you can do everywhere and very cheap. So it means that by this, you can actually get this one much more accessible and to a much, uh, much cheaper prices. But reading is one thing. If we want to really have this idea of actually being able to to reprogram, we should also be able to write DNAs. So what does that mean? Well, if I have the sequence, I type it in in my computer, how can I then get the DNA out of that? Well, actually what you can do today is when you have it, you can mail it to a company. And this company has a 3D printer, an advanced one, and they can print these DNA. So there's a way to actually stitch it together and you get the DNA you want. Um, when having this, well, then you can get it back. They freeze dry it, you get it back in, in the mail. You dissolve it in water, and then you go through the normal processes of amplifying the number of DNA uh, strings and assemble them and putting them into, uh, into the cell, and then you can change the behavior of the cell. That part is easy, but to get the cell to survive on this is, is much more tricky. Uh, <clears throat> but it means that we have the possibility to actually programming uh, life itself and it's basically the same model so I have a behavior an algorithm that I want my cell to do and I want to devise an algorithm that can take this together with the requirements something about what are the molecules that you should detect what should you produce based on this and what is the technology some bacteria that I want to program and I just get out of this one the sequence that is needed to do this sounds easy it's not as easy but almost, and then I can mail it and get it back and put it into the cell. Um, uh, <clears throat> an example of this uh, that has been uh, shown to be able to uh, be doing in, in petri dishes in a lab is uh, trying to re-engineer a virus so that, uh, that it can fight uh, cancer cells. So what does it mean? It means that uh, if the virus enters into a cancer cell, it detects that this is a specific cancer cell, and then it starts multiplying, as viruses are doing, until the time where it sort of kills the, the host uh, cell, and it bursts, and a number of new viruses get out and infect the cells in the area around it. Um, well, this is, this is fine. What happens if it enters a normal cell? Well, if it enters a normal cell, it's programmed to detect that this is not a cancer cell, and therefore it should just kill itself instead of. And the program to do this is not much bigger than this. <laughs> and I mean, this would be nice. It's, it takes a long time to, to figure this out. But if we're able to detect these things, it's actually possible to write such a program, compile it into the DNA parts that would actually be able to sense these molecules and act, up, act upon them so that they uh, uh, could fight uh, these cancers. I believe we, there will be some time before we see this as, uh, as something that would actually uh, be a basic cure. But uh, the nice thing about these approaches is that you uh, get something which is much more specific uh, than what we have today with chemotherapy. There are other techniques which are also based on nanotechnology to actually get the medicine to the cancer cells. But this is actually using, uh, let's say, uh, life itself as an engine to, uh, to do this. Okay, so that brings me to the summary. So what I try to give you an idea of is that what we see at the moment is that there is a strong convergence between a number of different technologies that would have a really profound uh, impact on what is possible for us to do. And of course, these technologies may be uh, some of the drivers for, for disrupting things that we are uh, seeing to, uh, today. And this is uh, the biotech, 
the information technology, the nanotechnology, and then the cognitive technologies, which is actually understanding how uh, uh, our brain works and how we can uh, uh, we can derive of algorithms that are not static but actually learning by uh, over time uh, bringing all this to be, uh, together this is known as the pink uh, technologies and this will help us in this uh, the 40s so we have seen things get digitalized then they get de dematerialized so we can work with things in, uh, in, uh, in virtual. We can build things like uh, understanding how the behavior of changing a cell will happen. We can do this without actually going to the vet labs. Uh, we see a democratizing, which was also what uh, Clayton Christensen talked about, that it would be ac accessible to much more uh, people, uh, these uh, advanced technologies, not for the few. And then also we see this being monetized so that uh, things become accessible and extremely cheap uh, because of these things right with this uh, I will end my talk and thank you for your attention thank you very much. Yes, I bring, bring Jan thank you very much uh, questions you have that or is you all blown away? Are you scared of this? Yes, please. Um, one question, uh, the biochip or the biopods, what is the energy driven uh, them? Uh, you would say electricity for the transistors, but what are, are the fuel right. for those? So uh, for the biochips, it's, uh, it's the air pressure. So uh, one of the things that you see is that we can build these nice labs uh, and when you see them isolated, it looks nicely, but if you zoom out a little bit, you see all the pumps around it. So people are joking about that this lab on a chip is actually a, a, a chip in a lab. Uh, but when you start working with this, and then this is some of the things that we're working on, is that you can also do logic with, with, uh, with air, with pneumatics. And then you can start bringing some of this control into the chip we are working on so the idea here is that you will only have one pressure source and then you can compute the needed pressure inside the chip to uh, actuate the, the valves <clears throat> so that's one of the the things forward and i think we need that to to really be have something that we can carry around uh, the example of the chip that i was telling you about that we are using with the smartphone is a very simple one it's sort of like one channel with a nanowire in uh, where <clears throat> where uh, the wire is just a sensor that can sense very small amount of uh, specific molecules and we can electrically detect uh, the amount of molecules that are in the bloodstream now for the uh, for the living cells it's it's this it's themselves i mean and this is why it's really really tricky to do these things we may have the technology to to change the dna we can get it into the cells but whether it would actually uh, work uh, is a big question because every time I mean it's a very delicate balance so if you put it in to, to do more work it may not have enough energy and therefore it dies so people are working on on various things and one of the things uh, that that people are working on is to build sort of a minimal cell so that means a <clears throat> basically a container that can uh, that can uh, sustain itself and has some capability to do something more and then you can put this more into it but to, uh, to reduce uh, trying to figure out uh, what is the minimal DNA sequence that you can actually have that will create a living cell that can replicate itself and so on is, is, a, is a huge uh, challenge. But it's, it's out of the energy that is in. So you just need to feed it with, with sugar. Another interesting thing, which is something that I'm, so we are working with this uh, synthetic biology and what is really astonishing is that I mean maybe you can you can reprogram it, but but now you have a cell when you start getting it to work, it starts multiplying, and this is sort of like completely different from from uh, from the mindset of a computer. I mean, you have one computer, you program it; it's still one computer, but here you start getting more and more of these, and they mutate, so they may or may not work. But you can do a lot of interesting things. I mean, people are working on, you can, you can control the communication between cells, so you can actually do networks uh, stuff. And this is one of the things that uh, people program 
into the cells to make sure that if they escape, nothing happened, they killed themselves. If they, are not, if they don't sense the other cells, it kills itself. So if it by accident escape, it cannot sustain living in the outside of, out of the lab. <clears throat> and there's a lot of these issues uh, involved in, uh, in this. What should you change and not change? I mean, I've s you've seen some very, very strange things. I mean, there was a group in the US that managed to find a new uh, base pair that they could introduce. So instead of four letters, you now have six letters and the cells could obtain it and replicate with it. That means that you have, instead of 20 uh, amino acids, you have like 170 amino acids, something we have never seen. What is the consequence of that? What does that mean? Uh, so there is a, a lot of uh, difficult issues, ethical and, and so on, and how to, how to do this. But it's really important that we start discussing these things because uh, I was at a I gave a talk somewhere and people said, but how can you, you we didn't have to make sure that those researchers working on this have signed agreements on how, what to do and not to do and stay inside these labs and uh, you put regulations on them and so on. But a lot of this technology is so easy accessible. You don't need these advanced things. I mean, people can do it if they can get access to the things, which has some kind of scary uh, consequences. What's the limitation? Is that our brains? <laughs> or is the technology <laughs> On what we can uh, dream of? Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, uh, I would like to think it's our brain, but as we have seen some of this artificial intelligence moving forward, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good question on, so on who is... Blue color people now. I mean, you... you yeah, I, I think... Uh, I mean, you'll probably follow it also. There's a lot of debate about artificial intelligence and uh, people signing letters about uh, creating friendly AI and so on, uh, whatever that means and uh, whether we can be in control. And a funny uh, story is uh, that has, sometimes you, you try out things uh, on the net. So uh, recently, Microsoft made a, a Twitter bot so uh, an artificial intelligence that was uh, tweeting. And it was a learning algorithm, so uh, by being in contact with, uh, with other people, it, it learned. And it didn't take long before it became extremely resistant. So it was claiming that it was also supporting Hitler and didn't like Jews yes. and, and things like this, and Microsoft had to pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> and said there was something wrong with it. But that's sort of like, it's a, so what, what does friendly AI mean? I mean, it's a, who's training it and, and what are, how can you build in sort of like a moral con uh, codex that uh, mimic the way that we want things to behave and so on? There's a lot of really, really challenging, interesting questions in this. But okay, I don't think we have an answer. answer. Yes, there's another question. Please. Can you point out to any Danish examples of disruptive technology? I was just <coughs> searching my own brain. Find of disruptives in, uh, in, in that. Uh, and I was just wondering, is this a cultural thing and how to treat the culture? So, so I think, uh, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure we're quite out of it. Yeah, in, in uh, could be. I'm, I'm not quite sure, I mean, I think for the mindset it's, it's, uh, it's different. What we see now is that our, over the last five years or so, the mindset of students have changed. Before that, any student would, the, the dream would be to go out in a big company, earn a lot of money, get settled with house and wife and kids and everything. Uh, uh, nowadays, it's, it's really a challenge uh, for the big companies because uh, salary is not enough. They want to explore, they want to try out things themselves. I mean, there's a lot of stories also, so that also creates to it. But I, but I think when you see what have happened uh, on, on the um, innovation or entrepreneurship uh, startup companies in, uh, in Denmark, this is tremendous. Uh, 
I mean, we still have to see. We, there are some that have grown quite, uh, quite big, but uh, there's a lot that, and I have one of them, that doesn't uh, get that far, even though we believe that uh, it has a good technology. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. I think I'm quite sure it's not the last time we have you because you have too much to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.